everyone, I'm Emily and I'm here with Promise and Cheyenne and today we're going to read chapter 11 of Misty is Drink Tea. It's called Storm Shy. Feeling much happier, Paul and Maureen joined the throngs heading to see Black Comet. Black Comet was five years old. For, three, for those years he had been brought over from Pocomoke on the mainland to race for the pony penning crowds on the eve of the sale. And for three years he had won. Twice he led by several lengths, and once he led only by a nose, but always he won. The night was no different. Black Comet pranced to the starting line, sure of himself. His jockey too was sure. They both seemed bored with the excited antics of the two other, oops, of the two other entries. One was a flashy black and white pony named Patches. He danced on his hind feet, Bolted across the starting line and had to be brought back again and again. The other entry was Lucy Lee, a nervous little mare. Black Comet threw back his head and let out a high horse laugh at them as if to say, you're wasting my time. And they were. The race belonged to Black Comet from the start. He broke out in front and stayed there. Maureen beat her fist on the fence rail. Come on, Patches. Come on, Lucy Lee. Don't let Black Comet win every time. Next year, the Phantom will be in there, Paul kept saying. Next year, the Phantom. Just as Black Comet crossed the finish line, a bolt of lightning split the sky. At that same instant, Paul felt a strong hand grip his shoulder. It was Grandpa B BB. His face was spattered with dirt and his clean blue shirt and ribbons. This squall ain't a promise no more, he shouted against the rising wind. It's here. Paul, you stay and help the fire chief. Maureen, you come home with me. And Paul, if the storm gets too heavy, he called back over his shoulder. You take shelter in our truck. It's back up nigh to the cult pen. The ground burst into noise and confusion. The wind whined. It caught at the tent flaps, snapping them like whips. White paper programs spiraled through the air, driven fast first one way, then the other. Children, overpowered and frightened, cried to be taken home. Thunder rumbled deep out of the heavens. Colts in their pens squealed. Stallions trumpeted. Paul fought his way to the pony pens, dodging people, dodging pieces of paper which the wind swept into his face. He could scarcely see his way. The strings of colored electric poles waved back and forth throwing weird shadows. At last he came upon the fire chief, brandishing his cane and shooting directions. Dan, you do this. Joe, you do that. Paul. Paul strained his ears to hear, but suddenly the sky seemed to open and rain fell in great torrents. The sweating lights went out, plunging the island into darkness. Everyone go home, called the chief. Nothing we can do now. A flash of lightning showed him limping towards his car. Paul did not follow. The rain beat down on him fiercely. It felt cold and hard like gunshot. How can Misty stand it? She's so little, he thought. She's bound to be storm shy. I know what I'll do. I'll carry her to the truck and shelter her until the storm is past. Warned by his decision, he ran past the colt pens and onto the big corral. Lightning sizzled across the sky, flooding the earth with an eerie white. It showed the wild ponies separated into four bands. Paul's eye leaped from one band to another, trying to find the Pied Piper family, but darkness closed in. He held his breath, waiting for another flash. Where are you going? It came. It picked out the stallion's creamy white mane. Paul scrambled over the fence. He waited again. His eyes fastened on the spot where the Pied Piper's band stood, huddled. He held onto the fence with one hand and made a watershed over his eyes with the other. He waited again for the lightning. It came tearing across the sky. He could see the Pied Piper's family as plainly as if for daylight, but the Phantom and Misty were not among them. They were gone. Stolen. Some other stallion had stolen them. The thought flashed through his mind. Shivering and drenched, he ran from one band to the other. He stumbled over tree stumps and fell flat in the water. His mouth was gritty with sand and mud. 
he went on blindly, killing every hump in the grass, every fallen log. But nowhere in all that big corral could he find the tiny hole or her wild dam. Running, slipping, falling, running, he made his way to the pony trucks. Most of the trucks were empty, waiting for tomorrow's sale. A few held the coat or two big colts, big and shaggy. Sick with fear for Phantom and Misty, he sought the shelter of Grandpa Bebe's truck to think out where they might be. Could Phantom have leapt the fence? Could Misty have rolled under it? He stopped short. There, in the body of the truck, under a piece of tarpaulin, he felt rather than saw a slight stirring. He trembled, not from cold, but from fear that what he prayed was a mare and her colt would turn out instead of bags to be bags of feet. He cried out for a flash of lightning. It came in a streak. the truck with yellow light and in that split second Paul saw the phantom and Misty their heads lowered in a corner like children being punished at school. He threw back his head for joy and let the rain be on his face. So that was why grandpa's shirt was torn and his face seamed with dirt. He had brought them to shelter before the storm broke. Paul opened the door of the cab half expecting grandpa to be there. It was empty except for grandpa's old rain jacket that lay on the seat and the strong smell of tobacco. He ripped off his wet shirt, his denim pants. His teeth chattered as he pulled on the warm, dry jacket. It was so long it almost covered his underwear. He ran around to the tailgate of the truck and steadied himself on the spare tire. Slowly, cautiously, hardly daring to breathe, he climbed up and over the tailgate and into the storm. The storm blotted out any sound he might have made. But the phantom sensed his presence. She neighed sharply to Missy, who caught her fear. Paul could The storm blotted out any sound he might have made, but the phantom sensed his presence. She neighed sharply to Missy, who caught her fear. Paul could hear the small rat-a-tat-tat -tat of her hooves. He leaned hard against the stakes of the truck, every muscle tense. Phantom would either charge him or stay as far away as possible. He waited, counting the seconds. He could hear the rain sloshing over the tarpaulin, spilling down the sides of the truck. He could smell the steamy warmth of furry bodies. He could smell the sea, and in the occasional flashes of light, he saw the copper and white tail of the phantom sweeping nervously over Misty. Paul let out a deep sigh of relief. She was not going to charge him. He never knew how long he stood there. He only knew that after a while, the phantom no longer mistrusted him. She seemed to doze off for seconds at a time, as if she felt a oneness with him. She and her foals and the shivering wet boy were fellow creatures caught in the storm. Prisoners of the elements. I'm sorry. <laughs> Together, the words sounded a bugle and Paul. Time stood still. There were only the wind and the rain and the three creatures together. Aching to reach out and touch first the shaggy coat, then the silky one, he plunged his hands deep into Grandpa's pockets to stay the impulse. His fingers felt a warm, slightly sticky object. He squeezed it. He traced a few dried stems, then paper thin leaves pressed solidly together. It was a twist of chewing tobacco. Quickly, he pulled it out of his pocket. The spicy sweetness of molasses filled his nostrils. He took long, deep breaths of it. His mind was turning somersaults. Molasses, molasses, how ponies love it. Often, he had seen Grandpa cut a quid for watch eyes. With trembling fingers, he broke off a sizable piece and held it onto the outstretched hand. For a long time, he waited. When he could no longer stand, he sank down on the cold, wet floor of the truck, still holding his hand toward the phantom. He waited, motionless. He listened to the storm bell tolling out in the bay and to the rain swishing and swirling around him. He felt little rivulets of perspiration run down his back. He grew hot and chilled by turns. 
His, arms grew, his arm grew numb, then began to prickle as if hundreds of red-hot needles were jabbing him. His head reeled. It ached for lack of sleep. And just when his hand was about to drop, he heard slow questioning hooves placed one at a time on the floor of the truck. One step forward, then a pause filled in by uh, the truck. Then a long pause filled in by the sobbing of the wind. Then another step, and another. Now a, brand, a breath on his hand, now feelers sending chills of excitement up his arm, racing through his whole body. Now a soft muzzle whipping his palm. The tobacco gone, lifted out of his hand by a pony so wild that she had upset a boat, so wild that for two years no one had caught her. A wild thing eating out of his hand. He wriggled his fingers in wonderment. All the numbness had gone out of them. He was not even trembling. Only the sharp ecstasy, the feeling that all of life was worth this moment. The roundup, the discovery of Missy, the swimming across the channel, they all melted into this. The moments rushed on. The storm quieted. Paul could hear the phantom mouthing the tobacco. He tried to keep awake to enjoy the pleasant, soothing sound that his eyes drew. His breath steady. He fell into a deep sleep unmindful when the phantom nosed him curiously from head to foot. Then she too began to doze. At last, Missy sank down in exhaustion. Her head fell across Paul's lap, not because she wanted human comfort, but because she was tired from the hard drive and the swim. The floor of a truck or a boy's lap were all the same to her, so long as her dam was near. It was thus at dawn that Grandpa Beebe found them. That end.